Should we kick yeah. this off? Okay. Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. Later in the pod, we'll have an interview with friend of the pod, Adi Barkin, who traveled to D.C. this week to testify at the very first congressional hearing on Medicare for All. Um, but first, we've got a lot of news to talk about, from William Barr's Senate testimony to a thrilling new bipartisan infrastructure plan to the Democrats' prospects of taking back the Senate in 2020. Uh, also, be sure to check out a very lively episode of Pod Save the World, where Tommy and Ben talked about the escalating situation in Venezuela, the Trump administration's designation of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, and whether the Russians are using beluga whales as spies. What? <laughs> cool. Seems plausible. I have to say, Ben and Tommy walked out of the studio yesterday after Pod Save the World, and, and Rhodes looks at me and he's like, you know, I don't say this often, but it was a really good episode. <laughs> Very... <laughs> Very proud of himself. <laughs> that is so funny on a hundred levels. <laughs> I know. Um, there was also a very cool new episode of With Friends Like These last week, where Anna Marie Cox talked with author Stephanie Land about her experiences as a maid and how those myths affect policy and perceptions of low-income people. Uh, it's a great episode of With Friends Like These, so definitely check that out. Uh, all right. Let's get to the news, Dan. Uh, on Tuesday, we okay. <laughs> On Tuesday, we learned that special counsel Robert Mueller wasn't too happy with Attorney General William Barr's characterization of Mueller's report in his now infamous four-page letter. On March 27th, the special counsel wrote to the Attorney General that Barr's letter, quote, did not cap, <clears throat> sorry, that Barr's letter, quote, did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of Mueller's work, and that as a result, there is, quote, public confusion that threatens to undermine public confidence in the outcome of the investigation. Mueller urged Barr to immediately release the summaries his team had prepared and followed up with a phone call to the Attorney General. On Wednesday, in front of the Senate, Barr called the letter, quote, a little bit snitty during his testimony to the Judiciary Committee. Dan, how significant is it that Mueller wrote this letter in the first place? Why did he write it? Well, it's a... I think it's very significant because I was listening to Garrett Graff, uh, who's a reporter who has covered uh, Mueller as closely as anyone over the years. And Garrett was on CNN last night. He said he has read every utter public utterance that Mueller has made, written, spoken, speeches, et cetera. And with one exception, this is the most sternly worded, angriest letter that Mueller has written. And the other one was about the release of a suspect in the Lockerbie Pan Am bombing, which was sort of the signature case that Mueller had worked on, the one he cared most passionately about. So the fact that he put this in writing is a huge deal. Bill Barr is someone who weirdly, I guess, once was a friend of Mueller's. He could have easily called him, but he put it in writing for a reason, which is so that there, he could document in real time with, you know, essentially with a, a date and time stamp on it, his concerns about what was happening. So as so we could get to a moment like today where people could look back and say, this isn't, this isn't like three months later he does an interview or testifies in front of Congress, if anyone could ever get their shit together to make that happen, and says that it's, we now know that in the immediate aftermath, when we were all concerned about this, Bob Mueller was also concerned about it, validating our concerns with both Barr's behavior and the way in which the media acted as a stenographer for Barr's cover-up of what Mueller actually found. So, I mean, should this letter have come out sooner? Was, was Mueller played by Barr? And, like, what could he have done to prevent Barr's mischaracterization of his report? Because, you know, I heard a lot of people yesterday say Mueller's gotten played, and I think there's some truth to that, but I'm, I was trying to think, all right, what steps could Mueller have taken knowing that his perspective at the time that he delivers the report to Barr is... Um, I sort of respect this guy. This guy is a friend of mine. Now, of course, at that point, Mueller should have also known that Barr wrote this, you know, 20-something page memo before he got the job about why the president can't obstruct justice. So maybe there are a few flags <laughs> um, in Mueller's mind here. But what, what steps could he have taken to avoid this, do you think? He could have released this letter when it happened. He could mm. have spoken publicly when it happened. He shouldn't have waited weeks to, for it to come out. It has been two weeks since this report came out. It has been over a month since the original bar letter. 
And one of the reasons that, you know, as people like us and others were screaming about the media coverage, which so which took everything Barr said as fact, was we were saying this, like, wait for the report, wait for the report, wait for the report. And what a lot of people were saying was if Mueller did not agree with what Barr was saying, we would know. But right. He, but <clears throat> point in fact, he didn't agree with what Barr was saying, but we didn't know. So Mueller's silence was taken as validation of Barr's approach. And I think Mueller's approach here bespeaks a larger problem that I don't want to say Democrats because Mueller is not a Democrat. He is a, he is a Republican, but even more than that, he is a nonpartisan public servant. But if you sort of divide the world from the people who will do whatever what Trump wants and the people who think Trump is a real danger to the country, our side is getting played left and right because we refuse to acknowledge that they break all the rules. They stomp over all the norms. They will do anything and everything to win. And we are playing by these Marquis of Queensbury rules, and we're getting our ass kicked left and right. The way Mueller handled this is the way you handle it in a normal situation. But we are well beyond fucking normal here. And this was a loss. He got, he did get played. We all got played. And as we'll talk about soon, the Democrats in the House are in the process of getting played right before our eyes. Yeah, Mueller is an institutionalist who is confronting people who do not believe in institutions and believe that they can trample them at any moment. And that is sort of the fundamental um, mismatch here. And you have people like Mueller and law enforcement um, who are, you know, like you said, nonpartisan, um, who are sort of losing this battle to preserve and defend our institutions. And then you have Democrats who are also seemingly unwilling um, to play hardball. Um, and, and then you have Donald Trump and a bunch of Republican lackeys and Trump loyalists who are willing to do anything. And part of the reason they do this is because they know no matter what they do, they will still get their side <laughs> covered fairly in the news. Um, and it will be, well, not fairly massively, but they'll, they'll still get, they'll still get a both sides out of it, right? Democrats will do this and Republicans will do this. And so they're like, well, we can do whatever we want because, um, you know, people will still find fault with the Democrats. It's crazy. It's so frustrating. If you've ever been involved in any sort of competitive enterprise, you know, you can't win. If you adhere to the rules, the other side doesn't. And then there is no referee or umpire to penalize the other side by for not adhering to the rules. It's just now I am not arguing we should be like Trump, we should be like Barr, but we have to adjust our strategies to recognize who Trump and Barr are. We have to stop fucking pretending that these are normal times. They are not. This is we are in a incredibly high stakes apocalyptic moment for American democracy and it's like it's I have been screaming mostly silently into the void all morning. And by that, I mean tweeting. (laughs) Um, So when Barr appeared in front of the Senate on April 10th, Senator Chris Van Hollen asked, did Bob Mueller support your conclusion? Barr said, I don't know whether Bob Mueller supported my conclusion. During a hearing on April 9th, Charlie Crist, representative from Florida, asked Barr about reports that some members of Mueller's team were, quote, frustrated that Barr's letter, quote, does not adequately or accurately portray the report's findings and asked him if he knew what they were referencing. Barr said, no, I don't. I suspect they probably wanted more put out. I suspect they probably wanted more put out. Dan, did William Barr lie to Congress on multiple occasions? Yes, he did. I think that, and we now know Nancy Pelosi thinks that, because according to reports today, she said in an internal Democratic meeting that Barr committed a crime. Yeah, and then... The Attorney General lied to Congress in order to help provide political protection to the President of the United States. That is a serious fucking deal. It should be treated as such. So let's talk about yesterday's hearing at the Senate Judiciary Committee, where the Attorney General offered... No apologies, no real explanations to any of the questions raised by Mueller's letter, and pretty much acted like he was Donald Trump's personal lawyer, uh, suggesting that the White House, quote, fully cooperated (laughs) with Mueller's investigation, even though Mueller specifically documents that the president obstructed justice by trying to end that investigation. (laughs) That's not full cooperation. (laughs) That's the opposite of full cooperation. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, how, how many times did you yell at the television screen during Barr's testimony? Because Tommy and I were watching I, yesterday I, in the office just screaming. <laughs> I was yelling at Barr. I was yelling at the Democrats. I was yelling at the Republicans. I mean, it, it was a thoroughly exhausting experience. And were it not, as I'm sure we'll discuss, for Kamala Harris at the end, I might have just driven off into the wilderness and stayed there forever. <laughs> That's what I was. So, that's a great segue. Um, one moment that stood out to me as well was when Kamala Harris got Barr to admit that he didn't review all the underlying evidence in Mueller's report before he concluded in his letter that, quote, the evidence developed during the special counsel's investigation is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. <laughs> didn't look at the evidence, but the evidence is not sufficient. Um, I mean, Dan, what, what other wild. moments, what other moments besides that one stood out to you during the course of the testimony? I mean, the whole thing was mind boggling. The mm. things that Barr said were just truly mind boggling that someone would actually say these things in public. And we could talk about how Bill Barr establishment lion that he is became this way at some point. But the most astounding to me was Bill Barr, the attorney general of the United States, believed that a president can take steps to stop an investigation into that president if he or she believes that they are being falsely accused. Now, let's just play with this logic puzzle for one second. If the president ends the investigation, no one will ever know whether the accusations were false. Therefore, the president will, can end any investigation they want, whether they're real or not, because there can be no consequences. We can never know whether the actual crime is committed. It is a wild position to take, and it is one that I would wager, John, just, just just, bear with me for a second here. I would wager that if and when a Democrat is president, presuming that ever happens again, Barr and the Republicans will not hold that position. Yeah, you think? I mean, here's the thing. Like, it is obviously absurd for the Attorney General of the United States to have a legal theory that he talks about publicly that the President of the United States is allowed to shut any investigation down based on his own personal belief, just a leap of faith on what he feels about the investigation. That's fucking nuts. But Barr also repeatedly says there is no underlying crime, there was no underlying crime. Now, of course, the, the President who ends the investigation uh, doesn't know whether there's an underlying crime committed by any of the other people that were being investigated, like Michael Flynn, like Paul Manafort, like any of the other people. But us, even putting that aside, there was a fucking underlying crime, and no one is talking about this. The President of the United States was ultimately implicated in a federal crime. He committed a campaign felony with Michael Cohen, directed him to commit a campaign felony. That's not Democrats saying that. That's fucking federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York have said that he's individual one and that he was an unindicted co-conspirator in that crime. So, yes, there was a motive for Donald Trump to shut down the investigation because he was worried that the investigation would uncover a crime. It was the crime he helped Michael Cohen commit right before the election that helped him cheat in order to win the election by covering up the Stormy Daniels story. I don't understand this. I feel like I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> it's like, I, <laughs> I mean, and it's, as, as we pointed out before, Bob Mueller says this in his report. He anticipates this argument from... People from Bill Barr in the Trump world and says that even if he was innocent of quote unquote collusion, even though we know collusion is not a crime, that, and I, let's not even say innocent is not the right word. He is not fucking innocent of anything. Even if you could not, the mother could not prove an active conspiracy between Trump's dipshit son, his dilettante son in law, and the Russian government, he is, can still be guilty of obstruction because the president was very clearly worried about other crimes and other embarrassments. And you can be guilty of obstruction of justice if you try to obstruct the investigation, prevent them from uncovering other things, even if those other things aren't crimes. Right. So even if we even if you take away that the idea that we already know that were Trump not president of the United States, he would have been indicted in the campaign finance crimes committed that he committed with Michael Cohen. I mean put that aside, you pretend like that didn't happen, which seems like everyone has fucking done. Then even if you do that then he, it is still a crime to try to stop the investigation if you're worried the investigation will uncover non-criminal but ultimately embarrassing 
details about yourself. People have done this to pre- have gotten in trouble legally over time by, to try to prevent investigations that uncover adultery or family secrets or other types of embarrassing information you don't want in the public. And so, yes, he can very well be guilty of obstruction of justice, even without a crime. We like this is like ask Martha fucking Stewart, who went to jail for this very thing. And so if only there was a high profile example of a celebrity from television who went down for something like this. Someone who was on the celebrity print and apprentice, in fact. <laughs> yes. Yes. Multiple celebrity apprentice uh, stars accused of obstruction of justice, committed obstruction of justice. Um, so this is all looking back, right, about the, the crimes, the crimes that, that Trump has committed in the past and being held accountable for. But there was also something that Barr said in this hearing that affects the future. Barr did not deny, did not deny that Trump continues to pressure the Justice Department to investigate his political enemies. And now we know why he did not deny that, because last night in the New York Times, we found out that Donald Trump, the President of the United States, has suggested to the Attorney General that he investigate Joe Biden. So we are now already, we are already seeing that Trump has decided because he is getting away with all of the shit that he has done in the past, the things he did to win the election, the things he did to cover up what he did to win the election, now he's saying, fuck it, I can use the Attorney General, I can use the Justice Department, I can use law enforcement to do whatever I want, and I'm going to investigate my potential 2020 political opponent. And basically, Barr didn't deny that that was happening yesterday when he was under oath. No, he just drooled on himself under the withering questioning of Kamala Harris. (laughs) I mean, how do you think that the Democrats on the committee did? Obviously, Kamala Harris was outstanding. I mean, this is, I know that she has done this for a living and she's a prosecutor, but still, it was, even knowing all that, it was an outstanding performance watching her. And I, I urge everyone to go watch the video of, uh, of Senator Harris drilling Barr um, for a couple minutes because it was uh, quite impressive. Uh, what do you think about the rest of the Democrats? <laughs> I mean, this isn't even really the fault of individual Democrats. It's just, it was not great. Like, can there not be a meeting? I know. Where they all get in a room and they said, here are the subject areas that we would like to get to the bottom of. Why don't you each take some? I don't understand. And <laughs> do that. Like, let's coordinate. Like, I just, like that, the, fa- the absence of that, I mean, I'm sure that meeting probably did happen, but like what happened after that meeting, I'm curious about. I am just frustrated by the, like, you have five minutes, or whatever it is, to question the Attorney General about his efforts to cover up obstruction of justice crimes in the President of the United States, one of the most serious things ever. No one wants your opening statement. Why would you waste one second of your five minutes speaking? That, that is not going to be on the news. It is not... Like, the other one's going to print out the congressional record and frame it and send it to voters. It just makes zero sense. The, this is true of Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate, but particularly the Senate. They're in love with hearing themselves talk. And that is the mistake. That, like, it's not just that Kamala Harris is better at this than all of them. And some people did better than others. Some were very bad. Some were fine. Some were good. But Kamala Harris didn't give an opening statement. Her first, she basically said hello to Attorney General Barr and asked him a fucking killer question. She did not, and when he was babbling and trying to delay and doing this relatively clever trick he does of pretending to not understand the question in order to buy himself, to eat clock and buy himself time to come up with a, what he thinks to be a legally okay, but ultimately misleading answer, because he wants to find himself in that ultimate gray area between truth and crime, he, she just pushed him. And she was like, I have another question for you. And she, like, she maximized her time. That is what we should do. Like, that, like, that, like, we should, like, that's the way to do it. We have been operating by the same flawed model of hearings for as long as I've been in politics, and I'm sure longer than that. Just ask good questions, maximize your time, don't give speeches. Uh, Dan, are you, is, is there something moving in your end? I keep hearing, like, a clicking motion. I don't know what it is. Oh, uh, that might have been, does it sound better now? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Say that just to so make sure that's what it is. Okay. Um, 
was I just going to say? Kamala Harris. Oh, yeah. No, I totally agree. And it's not just the opening statements either. It's like, don't ask questions that you're asking just for like a messaging purpose. You know, like there'll there'll be riffs like, Mr. Attorney General, do you think it's okay that the president committed all these crimes? <laughs> you know, it's like, you're not, you're not trying to like have a performance here. You're actually trying to get him to answer tough questions. And there's plenty of tough questions to ask. I mean, Kamala had only had five minutes, but she probably could have gone on for 30 and elicited other damning responses from William Barr during that time. And I don't know that anyone else really did that. Yeah, it wasn't great. It wasn't and great. And hopefully we, folks can, I'm not, I say hopefully, but I'm not optimistic, that people can learn the lessons before Bob Mueller comes to the next hearing. Although Lindsey Graham did suggest that Bob Mueller may never come to the Senate, so who the fuck knows? Yeah, well, we should get into that. Um, well, we should, we should note first that Republicans on the committee spent their time in questioning on your standard Fox News conspiracies about Hillary Clinton, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, all their favorite deep state all-stars. Um, their strategy has been to argue that Mueller's investigation was actually a treasonous crime perpetrated by Democrats. Uh, what do you think of that strategy? It's smart. And, like, this is, this is how Trump won, which is feed conspiracy theories to the base and just throw so much shit around that the folks in the middle say, well, it's all confusing – I don't know who's right. I don't have any really way of finding out. Certainly the media is incapable of telling me. So I'm going to default to my natural expectations, which is both sides are corrupt liars. And when the public thinks that both sides are corrupt liars, that inures to the advantage of the corrupt liar in the race, which happens to be Trump and the Republicans in this case. So this is this was effective yesterday. It was effective in 2016, and it is what they're going to do in 2020, and we're going to have to figure out how to how to fight it. Yeah, I mean, they all know that they they don't really want to waste their time trying to defend Trump, Trump's actions, Trump's crimes, Trump's abuses of power. Why would they defend that when they can just go on the offensive and accuse the other side of what they're being accused of? <laughs> it's that simple, you know? It's just, that's, that's sort of how they roll. Um, so, as you mentioned, after the hearing was over, Lindsey Graham told reporters he will not be calling on Mueller to testify, saying, quote, I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm not. I'm sorry. Saying, quote, I'm not going to do any more. Enough already. It's over. A few hours later, William Barr canceled his testimony to the House Judiciary Committee that was supposed to be held today, Thursday, because he didn't want to be questioned by lawyers. Um, Barr also missed a deadline to deliver the full unredacted Mueller report to the committee. Um, so, Dan, what's your reaction to this and, and what should Democrats do next? Where do we all go from here? knowing that the Trump administration has decided to obstruct the congressional investigation into the president's obstruction of justice and other potential crimes. Basically, they're trying to obstruct all investigation. They're stonewalling. They don't want witnesses to testify. They're not turning over documents. Like, what do Democrats do from here? I think we should endeavor to find a non-political bipartisan deal we can all work on together to heal the wounds <laughs> that of division in this country. I mean, <laughs> but like, does this, does this change your view on impeachment or, I mean, I know your view has, I don't want to, your view has not been hard and fast on impeachment, but has it, has your view evolved at all? Or what are you thinking in terms of the impeachment process? Well, let me, let me just sort of back up and give you a, a non-depressingly sarcastic answer to your question. Sure which is we have to you we have to recognize the situation for what it is it is a national crisis it is a crisis of our democracy it is a constitutional crisis there is no two ways about it the president is using every has co-opted every element of his government and his party to cover up crimes very serious crimes and we have to respond to such. This is not a normal world, right? The, even the rules of Watergate do not apply here. And because we said this before, that if this Republican Party was in charge of the House and the Senate when Nixon was, when, the, when Watergate happened, then Nixon would not have left office. He would not have been impeached. He would not have been, he would, he never would have, sorry, let me say it again. Nixon would not have been forced to resign from office. He would have served out his term 
and people in Washington, D.C. would be flying out of Nixon Airport right now. Like, we have to recognize the danger, the clear and present danger that Trump and this Republican Party present to America. And so how do we respond to that? By, look, we have limited tools. We have to use all of them. This idea that the House is going to spend another two days negotiating with Bill Barr over both the release of the full model, providing access to the full model report and uh, his own testimony is fucking absurd. They are trying to burn clock in order to hope the country and, and the voting public turns their mind and turns their eyes in another direction. And so the second Barr sent his letter last night saying he wasn't coming, they should have sent a subpoena. The second the clock ticked past the deadline for release of the Mueller report, they should have filed a contempt citation. We have to do all the things. I think the next step for Democrats is to open impeachment hearing, impeachment inquiry into Barr for two reasons. One, we cannot, we absolutely cannot let this sort of behavior stand because, as you mentioned, as it relates to Joe Biden, Barr has refused to recuse himself from the other investigation. So he is the person who will decide whether the U.S. Department of Justice charges Trump associates in Trump's inauguration, in Trump's businesses, et cetera. All of those, every one of those decisions, all the work done by the Federal Judiciary Network goes through Bill Barr. And I don't know about you, but I get a sense that he may not be on the level. And we know that the president, the president's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and Bill Barr are having conversations about launching investigations into Trump's political opponents for the purpose of helping him win the election. Like, this, this cannot stand. We have to do something about it. Doing it in the context of an impeachment inquiry, inquiry would give the Democrats more leverage to put pressure on the Republicans and find out more, use legal means to find out more about what is happening there. And so I think that is a, a, net, a good first step. And the reason I would go that step first is for as much as we know Trump has committed impeachable offenses, we, it would make us great to impeach him, and we can have the debate that basically you and me and Tommy and John and Brian have all day long about when, when and why to impeach, it's a moot point as long as Democrats are divided on that issue, which they are both divided on publicly and they're divided on the Congress. So I think that a, you're going to get more consensus around an impeachment into Barr while you continue to do the other investigations and try to figure out whether you can, whether you can build a unified front within the House of Representatives, Democratic Caucus and the House of Representatives to impeach Trump. I am all for impeaching William Barr, for sure. Um, I would like to see uh, joint impeachment proceedings um, that uh, attempt to impeach both William Barr and Donald Trump. Um, look, I, whether the impeachment of Donald Trump happens this month, next month, four months from now, I think there is no way out of this at this point. Like, we now know that Donald Trump believes it is okay to abuse his office in the following ways. He will shut down investigations, criminal investigations, into his own conduct. He will open criminal investigations uh, into his political opponents who try to challenge him. He abuses his power all the time. He um, uses his office to enrich himself. He tells Border Patrol agents down at the border that they should break the law and that if, uh, if judges try to stop them, they should just ignore judges because uh, they're under Donald Trump's command. He is basically promising that if he is given four more years, he will act even more as an authoritarian as he is right now. This is going to happen whether we impeach him or not, right? And I also realize that we're not going to get <laughs> the votes in the Senate from the Republicans because they're going to stand by him. But I do think impeachment proceedings, at the very least will focus the country's attention on not just what he's done that was laid out in the Mueller report, but all of Donald Trump's abuses of power. And then we can message this going into the impeachment proceedings by saying, like, we don't expect that Senate Republicans are actually going to do the right thing, put country before party, and vote to convict Donald Trump. But we at least want to put them on record before 2020 as to whether they think this behavior is acceptable or not. And then, for however many months... The eyes of the nation will be on a series of impeachment proceedings that will highlight all the all the crimes that Donald Trump has committed. And then, once he is impeached by the House and ex expectedly um, exonerated by the Senate, he will go into the election 
being a president who was impeached for the following behavior. And everyone will know what that behavior and conduct is because it'll have been all over the country. And voters will have that much more information before they go to the poll. For me, it's like impeachment may not work. I mean, it's, 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 it's not going to result in him getting removed from office before 2020. But like you just said, we have to use every tool we have because if we believe, if we fully believe, and if Democrats fully believe this, who've been elected, who are in Congress right now, if they believe that this is a national emergency, that Trump represents a national emergency, then we have to start fucking acting like it. If you don't believe he's a national emergency, then stop the rhetoric, stop the hyperbole, and go about doing other things. But if you actually believe that he has committed crimes and this is a national emergency, you have to do everything in your power to act like it and do something. I, I mean, it's... Whew. I mean, the only thing I would say to that is, like, yes, you're all right. The challenge we have is you go into impeachment with the Democratic caucus. Oh, I know. You have not I the know. Democratic caucus that you want. But I think I, th I think you have to put pressure on that caucus. Division within within Democrats, which there appears to be, then it is you can't you can't go to war with divided troops, right? Like, I, if there was no fucking lesson of Game of Thrones, then this is it. Uh, <laughs> That if you're and currently they're divided, so there has to be a pro to get where you want to go. There has to be a process to get Democrats united to it, right? You can't rush that. Which is, I think, if I know anything about Nancy Pelosi's strategy over the years, is that she gets she has a process to get people where she wants to go and make them think they got there on their own, and you can't beat them into it. And so, yeah, that I think that is what I see to be the underlying strategy behind her approach, which is we can't do it now because large numbers of our caucus, large numbers, think this is a bad idea. Now, they probably, that we can discuss whether we've elected all the wrong people or all of that, but if that is the facts on the ground, that has to be addressed before you can get where you're going. Otherwise, we will only read stories about Democrats divided over impeachment for a number of months until the resolution fails. So, so I totally agree with that. I guess what I'm saying is it's t one of the reasons that a lot of these House members are not on board with impeachment yet is they think it is not that important to the people who elected them. And so if, you know, if you're out there and you believe it's important to not just hold the president accountable for, for his crimes, but prevent uh, potential abuses of power that could affect the 2020 election because he's uh, dead set on investigating his political opponent during an election so he can win a second election... Uh, if you want to prevent that, if you think that's important, then it's time to reach out to your members of Congress and tell them that it's important because, you know, it's nearly impossible to change the minds of most elected Republicans. It is not impossible to change the minds of most elected Democrats. These are largely reasonable people who listen to the people who elected them, who listen to activists. And now is the time to make your voice heard, because if, as you say, Dan, Nancy Pelosi is trying to get them to that better place so that they're all on, on board together, which I believe they should be, then, you know, you're going to help Nancy Pelosi do her job by reaching out to her and to every other Democrat in Congress and let them know that this is important. I just, it's bad. Did you, <laughs> this is sort of an aside, but... talk about this every week until uh, Trump canceled the 2020 election? Yeah, probably. Did you, um... I sent this. I know I sent this around last night as I was preparing for the pod. I was just texting everyone uh, as I was catching up on the news. Did you see Hillary Clinton on Rachel Maddow? I, I saw the uh, the clips of it afterwards. Hillary Clinton. It was amazing. She goes through this whole scenario, and she's like, basically, what we're saying is in the Mueller report, it says Trump invited a foreign power to interfere in the election when he asked Russia for my emails. Right? She's like, so now we're saying that even though that's not a crime, technically a crime, that it's that it's okay, that it's okay to do that. She's like, so imagine, imagine if a Democratic candidate for president came on TV just like this and said, China, it would be very interesting if you went after Donald Trump's tax returns and publicized them. Imagine if that happened. It was, and it was funny because she's basically doing the, the hypothetical situation that she's talking about. And you're like, oh God, what if, what if China responds to Hillary Clinton doing that? But it very smartly points out the absurdity of the situation right now, where we've now crossed a Rubicon into presidential candidates of either party can openly invite foreign powers to interfere in our election to help, uh, to help other candidates win. I mean, it's crazy. We, you just, we can't let this stand. <laughs> this is all, I mean, it says, there's, 
I mean, over back in like more normal times of politics, and people would be like, which show is more realistic about life in the White House, life in politics, and you know, and we, they, like the smart answer is Veep because it, it at least highlights at an ab- absur- absurd level the absurdities of politics. But we've reached a new level where this is actually a plot line on Veep. This is exactly what is happening on Veep right yeah. now. It's it's parallel, and they, and look, they they wrote these episodes before this started happening, <laughs> so it's pretty. Yeah. Um, so, Dan, fortunately, all of this consternation over whether or not to impeach our president um, hasn't prevent Democrats. Sorry, let me say that again. Well, Dan, fortunately, all this consternation over whether or not to impeach our uh, criminally implicated president hasn't prevented Democrats from finding ways to work with him. Isn't that nice? It's one of the most tired jokes on Twitter, but this week was actually Infrastructure Week at the White House, where Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer met with Donald Trump and agreed to work on a $2 trillion legislative package for bridges, highways, broadband, water, and power grid grid infrastructure. Dan, why did this meeting happen? (laughs) What was the Democratic strategy in seeking a deal on infrastructure with Donald Trump the year before his re-election? This is one of the most bananas things that I have ever seen happen (laughs) in my life. And we just watched the bar hearing yesterday. If this meeting happened in the midst of the efforts to pass the tax cut or repeal the Affordable Care Act, I would have thought it was fucking crazy. Like, just like, why are we rewarding Trump with this? Like, but doing it at a time in which we were, there is an internal debate within the Democratic Party and a lot of, and in the country about whether this president has committed impeachable offenses to then drive to the White House, sit down with him, not talk about his crimes do legislative cosplay around a <laughs> infrastructure deal that has zero chance of passing and then heading out to the microphones to announce this deal and talk about how excited you are to work with him is fucking insane. It is insane. Cosplay. It is a stick in the eye of the base. It is like it makes zero sense to me. I will offer the caveat that Nancy Pelosi very rarely does things that I think that turn out to be this as stupid as I think this is. So it is possible that there is some hidden strategy here that is so deviously and secretly brand that we cannot see it. So I will hold out that possibility. But absent that, this is nuts. Just nuts. So I I completely agree with that, but I will offer I sorry, but I will offer the most uh, generous interpretation of a potential strategy from Nancy Pelosi just for the sake of our listeners. Um <laughs> So, so Donald Trump says that he's, you know, is interested in infrastructure and Pelosi and Schumer say, okay, we're going to go present our plan and it's going to be a plan. Basically they have said they have, they laid out some, um, uh, they laid out what they want in the plan, what the plan has to have. Right. And they say, okay, it has to be paid for with, uh, tax increases. So you have to find tax increases somewhere on, and Democrats want them on wealthy people to, in order to pay for infrastructure. Um, it has to include strong labor protections, has to include investments in renewable energy so that the infrastructure actually helps fight climate change. So we're going to have all these demands on infrastructure. And then Donald Trump is like, I like the infrastructure deal. And look, I had an infrastructure deal that I hated. Gary Cohn came up with it and it was bullshit. And he's right, it was. Um, because it relied mostly on sort of like private investment that was going to materialize out of nowhere when you actually need real government spending to build roads and bridges and the like. Um, so... Donald Trump in the meeting says, sure, yeah, I like your infrastructure plan. So Pelosi's probably thinking to herself, okay, there's no way in hell this ever passes the Republican Senate, that a bunch of Republican senators are going to go for tax increases to pay for infrastructure. Mitch McConnell's never going to let that fly. So then, once it fails, we can say, well, Democrats tried to work with this president uh, on a $2 trillion infrastructure package because we're actually focused not just on impeachment but on creating jobs. And this president and the Republican Party, because they only care about their wealthy donors and they only care about the rich, they let it fail. We're trying. They're not. So that, that to me, I, I guess, is the most generous interpretation of what her strategy might be. Yeah. I, like, I know I can intuit, based on years of watching Schumer, what his strategy is, which is let's make the Republicans in the Senate kill this, and we're running against a bunch of Republicans incumbents. Yep. Like, they, like, last... Cycle. It's a Senate strategy. Democrats have to protect their incumbents. This time, Republicans have to. So if you can say that Republican, you know, Jody Ernst or Tom Tillis or Cory Gardner oppose an infrastructure deal 
in order to protect tax cuts, then right, then like somehow that that would be some sort of silver bullet. But that I think that is not clever enough by half. Yeah. Right? Like this one of those ideas that masquerades is clever, but just is truly unclever. It yeah. just it like don't do this now. This is the wrong time to do this. Remember when Trump was elected and any time anyone did anything, like even use the words like president, like half a Twitter would yell at you and say you're normalizing Trump. Yeah. And it was sort of it was kind of dumb. It was a dumb argument. But this is actually Democrats normalizing Trump. We have just been delivered within the last two weeks a 400 page report that details in that I'm sorry, we've just been delivered a 400 page report that lays out in exquisite detail an effort to commit multiple crimes, to obstruct justice, to abuse power. And your next stop, before you even decide that you're going to subpoena the actual report, is to have a meeting about cutting a legislative deal. That, that to me, is it's just a mistake. Like, if you, you're – like, there is an element of you have to pay tribute and manage relations with the base. And because the base is what got you elected. The base helped deliver – not in – I'm sorry, the base helped deliver this Democratic majority. And part of the reason they did that was you provide a check on Trump. Now, this doesn't mean that you should never work with Trump, you should never do anything, but the timing of this makes zero sense, especially around something that's not going to happen. It cannot happen. Mitch McConnell has said it's not going to happen. It, I mean, it's just there's nothing that we've seen in the last two years. Look, fuck the last two years. The last 25 years of Republican politics that suggests that this can, this can happen. So I don't know... It, it, it makes no sense to me. It really yeah. doesn't make I mean, sense to me. I mean, I look at this infrastructure legislative cosplay <laughs> like I look like I look at the worry over impeachment, which is like sometimes you just have to get your head out of the polling data and just do what's right and also do what seems like common sense. Like the president has uh, committed obstruction of justice, says the special counsel. He is now trying to obstruct an investigation into that. He is abusing his power left and right. We are in a national emergency. We just have to act like that. It is not time to sit and have meetings about infrastructure. It is not time to sit and worry about whether we hold this one in contempt or wait three days for this subpoena or wait to do this or wait to do that. Like, It is all happening before our eyes, and we either have to act like that or just, I don't know, give up. <laughs> <laughs> because trying to like game out everything in a political well people are care about jobs and they care about healthcare so we have to do this and this is a messaging bill and we have to hold senate republicans on this vote and that like it you can it's good to have a strategy it is good to pay attention to public opinion i'm not saying that but you can easily overthink this stuff and i think the democrats have clearly <laughs> gone in the direction of overthinking it at this point i mean i think the problem is a lot of people are like you have to walk and chew gum. Mm -hmm. And so, like, yes, investigate the threads, but also do legislative stuff. But what that means is doing things like having the Medicare for All hearing or passing yeah. bills to strengthen the ACA or passing bills to repeal parts of the tax cut or the, the, the HR1, the bill to do political and electoral reform. Like, that, that's the chewing gum part of this, right? The chewing gum part is not go to the White House. And I don't even know, like, I don't know how to extend the, ch the gum chewing metaphor anymore, but that, don't do that. <laughs> Um, all right, let's talk about 2020, but let's talk about the Senate uh, for once. So Democrats currently hold 47 Senate seats and will have to defend Doug Jones's seat in ultra-conservative Alabama, which means that we probably need to flip four Republican Senate seats in order to hold a majority if we also hold the presidency. The top targets are Colorado, Arizona, Maine, North Carolina, Iowa, Texas, and Georgia, in roughly that order, though you may disagree. Um, but the party needs candidates first, and some of the biggest potential recruits are sitting this one out. Uh, Stacey Abrams announced this week that she'd be taking a pass on a run for the Senate in Georgia against David Perdue, saying, quote, my responsibility is not simply to run because the job is available. I need to run because I want to do the job. Um, Dan, before we even get to Stacey Abrams, how difficult do you think taking back the Senate will be? It is possible that we can take over the Senate, but it's going to take a lot of luck, a lot of good work. It's hard. Like these are, we have, we're going to have to pick up Senate seats in states that Trump is almost certainly going to win. Yeah, and that is hard. This is like our path to 
have a good year is much harder than the Republicans passed last year, where they where they were mostly they had enough seats in the states that Trump won by double digits in some case some cases, and we have to win either purple state, very purple states, or likely red states, and that is hard. It's possible, but it is hard. Yeah, because you know that list I just read. You think okay, Colorado, Arizona, and Maine are three states. You know, Arizona is a state that Donald Trump won in 2016, but of course, Kirsten Sinema won statewide Senate race in 2018. So potentially the Democrat in 2020 could win Arizona. And you think, okay, that gets you three. But also, by the way, Susan Collins, extremely popular in Maine, despite what Twitter and all the rest of us think. Um, And so that's going to be a tough one too. But then even if you get those three, um, probably you need the fourth. And then you're looking at North Carolina, where it's going to be an uphill climb. Obviously, Barack Obama won that state in 2008, but Democrats haven't really done that well since. Um, Iowa, another state that we lost by double digits in 2016. Texas, uh, you know, another one that's, that's maybe close. So obviously, Beto came close in 2018, but, you know, in a presidential year, all the conservatives and all the grassroots Republicans are coming out in that state. That's going to be hard, too. And same thing with Georgia. So it's tough. Those, that's a, it's a very tough map. Um, what do you, what, so what do you make of Stacey Abrams' decision not to run? There, there are few politicians that all of us at Pod Save America love more than Stacey Abrams. I think she is yeah. just unbelievable. She is exactly who should have been governor of Georgia. She would have been a great uh, senator from Georgia. She would make a great presidential candidate. She should be at the top of every vice presidential list. She is wonderful. I is very important that none of us, we cannot, we should not, we will not hold her to a different standard than we held Beto or Julian Castro or anyone else, any of those people who chose to run for president or do something else instead of run for the Senate. It is her choice. And if she is reluctant to do it, that is wise not to do it because reluctant Senate candidates are losing Senate candidates 100% of the time. Totally. Totally agree with that. I mean, I, 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 I think her explanation is, is, is perfect on this. You know, like, I need to run because I want to do the job, not just because the job is available. Like, I, I have to say I'm a little tired of people on Twitter acting like they are Senate strategists and they can just move around candidates like they're pieces on a chessboard and just, like, put them in races and that they're suddenly going to win. You know, like, <laughs> because, look, in, in 2018... Was Beto O'Rourke at the top of the list uh, of the National Party trying to recruit Senate candidates? No, he was barely on the radar and suddenly comes out of nowhere to almost win this race. There are probably other Beto O'Rourke's out there and Stacey Abrams is out there in Georgia and Texas and some of these states. And am I worried about recruitment? Yeah, absolutely. But I do think in this day and age when... You know, suddenly you can build up a Twitter following. You can raise money online much easier. Like the idea that the only recruitment strategy is Chuck Schumer going around and reading resumes and trying to get big names um, is sort of silly to me. And, you know, I saw Chris Murphy made this point in a Politico story about this. He said, we sometimes are way too obsessive about getting big, big name recruits. Our big name recruits in previous cycles haven't done so hot. Uh, a.k.a. Phil Bredesen in Tennessee, right? <laughs> that was supposed to be the big right. name recruit. We got Bredesen. We got him to do it. We're going to win Tennessee. And he was not a great candidate and lost by more than, way more than Better O'Rourke and more than most of the other candidates. I think it is important that we have good candidates. And it, yes, I think it's very important very. to point out that <laughs> big name candidates and good candidates are not the same thing and are oftentimes very different things. Um, and Chris Murphy is exactly right. Big name candidates. And it's not just this past cycle. I mean, I'm not sure another candidate was winning Tennessee this cycle. So this is like Phil Bredesen probably did better than the generic Democrat would. But whether it is Russ Feingold in Wisconsin in 2016 or Evan Bayh or Chuck Hagel, we have rerun people – many times and they have not done well. And it's in part because it's hard to be the candidate of change if you're the famous longtime politician of the state. And usually to incite an incumbent, you have to be the candidate of change, not just the candidate of the establishment of a different era. So the, I think the other important thing to recognize here is that the most important factor that will determine whether we take the Senate or not is not which candidates we recruit, 
Although it's important not to have bad candidates, right? Like a bad candidate can lose. But it is how well our presidential candidate does. Yeah. In 2008, when Democrats won, when Barack Obama won, all of the close Senate races tipped in the Democrats' favor. In 2012, when Barack Obama ran for re-election, all in one, a very good victory, all of the Democratic – I'm sorry, let me try that again. In 2012, when Barack Obama won a close re-election – let me try that a third time to be accurate. In 2012, when Barack Obama won re-election, all of the Senate races – including in states Obama did not win, like North Dakota, Indiana, and Missouri, tipped in Democrats' favor. In 2016, we lost the Pennsylvania and Wisconsin Senate races that we very much should have won, and we wouldn't be in this fucking mess right now had we won. Just other Clinton lost those states. And so this is also sort of gets to the absurdity of the infrastructure strategy, which is the best way to keep the House or expand our House majority, the best way to get the Senate majority is to run – the best campaign we can against Trump is to make him as weak as possible now so that we can defeat him later. And that is the only way to do it. And so, yes, we want good candidates. Yes, I think it's disappointing that some of these candidates have decided not to run. But more, more important than anything else is how Trump does, how a Democratic nominee does, that will determine not just the White House, but the other branches of government as well. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, to go through the different states and the different candidates we have, uh, it looks like in Colorado there are a number of potential challenges to Cory Gardner, so it seems like we are heading to a good place in Colorado. There'll probably be a primary because it seems like there's going to be a couple of Democrats that might challenge each other and to challenge Gardner. Uh, in Arizona, we have a very good recruit in Mark Kelly, um, so Arizona looks good. In Maine, you know, we 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 need some good recruits against Susan Collins. It seems like. Um, uh, Hannah Pingree, who was a former uh, Speaker of the House in Maine, and I think the current Speaker in Maine as well, I can't remember her name, I will figure it out, um, might, uh, might challenge Susan Collins, so, you know, and then maybe there'll be others as well. I think North Carolina is sort of worrisome. I haven't heard any names come out of North Carolina. Um, in Iowa, we don't have a recruit for Joni Ernst yet. Um, though J.D. Shulton has made some noise, who ran against Steve King as a potential candidate. Uh, in Texas, we do have a candidate now, M.J. Hager, who had one of the best ads of the 2018 cycle and almost uh, knocked off an incumbent there, is now going to run against John Cornyn, and it doesn't look like she's going to have a primary uh, because Joaquin Castro decided against running. So now we have a good candidate in Texas, and then in Georgia, um, we need a candidate. Um, any thoughts on that? Did I miss any? I wanted to add Kentucky to the list. Oh, yeah. Um, now, I am 100% acknowledging that winning Kentucky in a presidential year is challenging. But there was a poll out last week that says McConnell has an 18% approval rating. He is less popular than Ponscombe. I promise, we sh- I don't know who the, be- the best candidate is. I-, I know there were some efforts to talk about Amy McGrath running. I don't know where that stands. There might be other people. Um, Matt Jones, who's a uh, very interesting uh, sports radio host there, had talked about running in the past uh, and has sort of really proudly and bravely taken on McConnell uh, a lot over the last couple of years. Whoever it is, I promise you this, you have a shot. It's a long shot, but it's a shot. But the world is made up of people who have taken long shots. And I promise you, you will be very well funded because there will be yeah. a real appetite for we'll help. who runs against Mitch, Mitch McConnell. We will help. Um, and just and he shouldn't get a free fucking pass either. Like his conduct is both pre-Trump, during Trump. Like Mitch McConnell is the he's an asshole for all seasons. Everything that's terrible about America, <laughs> and he that should there should be a debate about that. That should be held to account. He should not get to run around the country uh, free and clear in a reelect. Yeah, no, he's I, I agree with that. Uh, some people are worried about like timing. Um, just for perspective, uh, Jackie Rosen, who's now senator in Nevada. And uh, Kirsten Cinema in Arizona, um, they announced their candidacies in uh, July for Rosen and September for Cinema the year before the election. So, um, yeah, it's getting close to the time where we want candidates to announce that they're running in the Senate, but they probably have a few more months to really firm things up. And, uh, and I'm sure, yeah, I, I I'm sure Schumer's working on it. Is where the panic should set in. Because you just want okay. time to raise the money, build name ID, build the organization. Um, and I mean, if we give people in now, that was great. 
even though Beto did not win, his being in that race for essentially two years was to his great advantage because that's how he was able to build the organization that he built in that race. Yeah. Um, finally, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett announced on Thursday that he's running for president. He's the 21st candidate to join the race and the seventh member of the Senate. Just a few weeks ago, he shared that he'd been diagnosed with prostate cancer and then he'd get in the race if surgery went well and he was healthy enough to do it. Now he is healthy and fully in the race. Um, Bennett's a former school superintendent who's been in the Senate for the past 10 years. He's got a moderate legislative record and he was part of a bipartisan group that tried to forge a compromise on immigration. He acknowledged in an announcement video today that, quote, you probably don't know me because I don't do cable news every night, which is a line that I love. Um, <laughs> Dan, what do you think of uh, what do you think of Michael Bennett and uh, twenty one candidates being in the race? <laughs> I I find the Bennett decision to be very interesting because unlike some of the other people who are running these longer these ob- much obviously longer shot races, Bennett is someone who has not proven to be overly ambitious in his time, has not proven to be in a hurry to get somewhere else, is not someone, as he points out, who is thirsty for retweets and cable news hits. He is an incredibly thoughtful, incredibly serious senator. I would bet that if you polled, you did a secret poll of Obama's inner circle senior staff of the last decade about who their favorite senator is, Harry Reid would be first, and Michael Bannon would be second. Yeah. He's just a very thoughtful, interesting guy. So, like, I, he is not someone who, that I would believe would just simply jump into this race just for shits and giggles, right? I, like, he's, like, he's thought about this, and I'm curious. Like, I, it, like, it's not clear to me what his path is. It's not clear to me what his case is, but he's thoughtful about politics. So I am, I'm actually I'm interested in this just because of my experience with Michael Bennett. He's a serious person, and so it's just it's it's. I'm surprised by this, but I'm curious about it. Yeah, uh, I, Tommy and I sat down with him during uh, the healthcare battle when we were in D.C. and we were interviewing a bunch of folks around the first time that they tried to repeal the ACA. And I f- I, I find him like very thoughtful, very smart. You know, we had a disagreement because he is talking about people who don't want to get rid of the filibuster. Michael Bennett does not want to get rid of the filibuster. (laughs) And I remember when we talked to him, he was making a case to us that we have to be better than Republicans. We have to protect institutions. You know, we shouldn't be acting, uh, you know, towards Supreme Court justices like the Republicans have done to Merrick, did to Merrick Garland. Um, So I think I, I probably have a lot of substantive disagreements with him about institutions and process and how to strategize against a party that's become radicalized. But um, he makes good arguments. He's thoughtful. He's fair. And so, you know, we'll see. It's also, by the way, another interesting part about this choice is um, he's running against his former boss, who was just here at Pod Save America the other day, John Hickenlooper. He was John Hickenlooper's chief of staff and then went on to go be, you know, superintendent of schools and and then, of course, uh, U.S. senator for the last 10 years. But Talk about all the different overlap in this primary uh, among these 21 candidates. We now have two candidates running who are both from Colorado, and uh, one worked for the other one. I would say one thing just about the 21 candidates running, mm-hmm. which is we that when you say, not you, John Favreau, but you, the royal you, I guess, yeah. uh, say there are 21 candidates running, it suggests it treats them all sort of equally, right? And yeah. I think it's very important to separate the people who have announced they're running for president and the people who are actually running for president. And that is not to, to, this is not suggesting that some of uh, these candidates are on a vanity exercise or anything like that. But running for president, to be a true candidate for president, means you have to be running serious, well-organized, well-funded efforts in the first four primary states. Yeah. Anything else is just a, you're not, you, you can have a business credit for this right now, but you're not actually someone who is going to be president. And I do think in how we think about this and discuss it, at some point, there, there's going to be a line where we're going to know who, can, who is actually doing the real thing and who is not. And it's not fair that money impacts. I think it's a real flaw in our system, but especially in our grassroots online donation world, there is a relationship between political support and financial support that 
is at least closer than it used to be. So right now there's, of that 21, less than half have shown any indication of the ability to run a serious presidential candidate, to to actually have a plan to accumulate the delegates you need to be the Democratic nominee for president. And I just think that's important to emphasize that and use that as sort of a dividing line as we think about the different candidates. There are candidates who are running serious campaigns. There are candidates who are not yet running serious campaigns, but maybe have shown some potential to do so. And then there are candidates who've been in the race for a while who showed none. Now, it's early, but it ain't that early. Yeah. And I, I won't... Uh... I won't make you name names. We'll uh, we'll hold off on that for a while. But I, I will ask, like, do you think in the minds of some of these candidates who maybe don't have real organizations in those early states right now, that they're thinking, well, Trump didn't have a big organization in these early states. He was sort of this gadfly when he first got into the race, um, albeit one with almost universal name ID because everyone in the country knows who Donald Trump is. So that's a huge difference between him and some of these other candidates. But, you know, he didn't start with a big organization. He didn't have this like real serious campaign staff. He didn't have like a real strategy at first. And then because he caught on via media attention, then he sort of backfilled the campaign as he went on. Do you think that's what a lot of these candidates are thinking? Like I could end up like Donald Trump too? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think there is this, theory that if Donald Trump can win the presidency, anyone can win the presidency. Yeah. And that fuels some of this. And there is some truth to the idea that in the internet social media age, you could be one viral moment away from leaping up to a top tier. Yeah. Right? I mean, like one viral moment. Look at Mayor Pete. Changed <laughs> at least the financial status of, Bro- of Beto O'Rourke's Senate campaign and changed his like absent that Colin Kaepernick clip, it's not clear that there that he would be running for president right now, right? Yeah. You know, absent a very clever and aggressive media strategy, it would be absurd that the uh, mayor of South Bend, Indiana, is in that top tier or top tier ish, or is, has the yeah. shown the ability to raise the money at least to put together a serious campaign. And I do think some people also look at Pete Buttigieg and they say, if he can find a way to hack the system to get to the top tier, then why can't Eric Swalwell or Tim Ryan or Michael Bennett or Andrew Yang, who has found a way to get into the debates while others have not yet? Right. So I think there is some of that. I think that the Trump example displays an ignorance of how the Democratic nomination process differs from the Republican process. Yeah. In the Democratic process. And we can have a debate about whether the first state should be a caucus and whether that state should be as white as Iowa is. That is a very fair debate and should be had. But as it currently stands, that is the first state. And the Democratic caucus process is a massive organizational challenge because there is a viability threshold where if a candidate doesn't get to 15 percent in an individual site, then you have to be able to get the like in a capacity to not just know your first choice voters, but who had you a second choice. The accumulation of delegates post the caucus of the county convention it is a huge effort. The Republican caucus does not operate that way. The Democratic caucus, Democratic nomination process proceeds through proportional allocation of delegates and votes, which means you have to be much more sophisticated in how you run your race. It takes longer. Republicans have winner take all, which is how someone like Trump could win. So, yes, there is this meta truth that Trump won. He's a fucking moron. Therefore, any fucking moron could be president. Or you could sit there and look at him and say, I'm a lot smarter than Trump. Why can't I be president? But it's just that both ignores the incredibly unique circumstances of Trump and who he is, because he wasn't some unknown person. He was a person with universal name ID. He was incredibly popular with the Republican base. In the 2012 election, in the midst of his birther crusade, he floated himself as a presidential, potential presidential candidate and was polling at the top of the polls. Yeah. So he's not. This is not a story of an like political Horatio Alger story of someone who came from nowhere. It's someone who was at the top and then won. And so it's a bad example to to guide your own political strategy because it's ignorant of how Trump won. And it's ignorant of how the democratic process works. Yeah. End and, of rant. And no, I, I agree. And I think if you're wondering who the democratic candidates are, who are actually running real serious races, sort of like look at who has a serious 
Iowa staff, a serious New Hampshire staff who's like hired a lot of field organizers and real staff in those early states. And you'll get a hint of even if they're down in the polls or up in the polls or whatever, they at least have the potential to really capitalize on whatever media momentum they may get along the way because they actually have an organization on the ground that can uh, carry them to victory. Um, okay, when we come back, we will have my interview with Adi Barkin.